Good morning. Uh, welcome to hearing number 42 of the 154th period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Uh, the hearing uh, this morning that we, will, that we will begin is on Human Rights and the Equal Opportunity Act and Commission in Trinidad and, and Tobago. Uh, we are joined today by the requesting organizations for the Coalition Advocating for Inclusion of Sexual Orientation or CAISO. We have Mr. Colin Robinson. Uh, for Winad, we have uh, David uh, Sumari. I hope I'm pronouncing. Actually, it's a community action resource from David Sumari from Community Action Resource. From Community Action Resource. Uh, my apologies. Uh, Sarah Silva from Winad, and, and she's not here today. My apologies. Uh, David Sumari from Community Action Resource uh, Care, and Sidel Crosby from The Art Is. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, the, uh, there are no representatives of the state. Uh, we regret that uh, they are not present. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate. We were hoping uh, to have uh, a fruitful dialogue with civil society and state representatives. Uh, in light of their absence, we will have a bit more time to hear in the initial presentation from the civil society representatives. And uh, we will have a bit more time for dialogue between the representatives present and the commission. I'd like to give you, if we could, as we spoke before, 25 minutes for an initial presentation. And may I please uh, request that you speak a bit uh, more slowly and, uh, than you might ordinarily do, because we are working through interpretation. Uh, the floor is yours. Good morning, commissioners, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, we're deeply disappointed that representatives of the state are not here. Since we've had communication about the hearing with the Office of the Attorney General, with the new Human Rights Joint Select Committee of the Parliament, and with the Equal Opportunity Commission itself. Our team today includes uh, the Women's Institute for Alternative Development, which mentors young women and girls, and works to strengthen governance and address small arms proliferation. Sarah De Silva is in the audience. I am Colin Robinson and represent CAISO. We operate a casework program that uses social work and the law to restore healing and justice to those who've experienced violations based on sexual orientation and gender expression. Following me will be David Sumari of Community Action Resource, the nation's oldest HIV support organization. Last spoken word poet, Seidel Crosby, part of the Art Is, a team who facilitate and create art that changes lives, will share a message. We welcome the opportunity to dialogue with duty bearers, with you and we'd hoped with the government, about how we strengthen relatively weak but promising human rights machinery in Trinidad and Tobago. The pace of the progressive realization of rights is a measure of the capacity, will, and performance of those institutions. Section 5.2.H of our Constitution enumerates a, quote, right to such procedural provisions as are necessary for the purpose of giving effect and protection, unquote, to its Bill of Rights. During passage of the Equal Opportunity Act, UNC Attorney General Ramesh Lawrence Mirage characterized this as not merely a legal and constitutional obligation, but a political one. Our Speaker of the House of Representatives, Wade Mark, who chaired the 1990s Joint Select Committee on Equal Opportunity Legislation as a government senator, reminded the Parliament in 2008, quote, it does not make sense having a set of rights and freedoms enshrined in our Constitution and the people are unable to enjoy those rights. If there are no institutions available to give effect to some of those fundamental rights, they become meaningless, unquote. We've chosen to focus on Trinidad and Tobago's Equal Opportunity Commission from here on EOC and its enabling legislation, the Equal Opportunity Act, EOA, because the latter is a landmark piece of Caribbean legislation that expands protections against state discrimination in constitutional bills of rights to create a legally enforceable right to freedom from discrimination and equality of treatment in the private sphere. Machinery for conciliation and adjudication of related claims and access to such mechanisms without the high threshold of legal counsel and expense. 
We've chosen this forum because our state affords us access to bring petitions or be heard before no other supranational human rights organ than the ISHR. Since 1999, it has denounced the American Convention on Human Rights and the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court. In my own case, since 2007, I have been writing to the Parliament, the Attorney General, and the Chief Parliamentary Council without audience to offer input on behalf of the citizens I represent in improving the Equal Opportunity Act. In June of 2013, I wrote urging an ISCHR hearing on some of the issues we will raise today. We've chosen this time because new opportunity exists for state institutions outside of the political branch to seize and fulfill our human rights obligations. In a process of reform, our parliament has just established a joint select committee on human rights, diversity, the environment, and sustainable development, chaired by independent Senator Reverend the Honorable Joy Abdul Mohan. A group of global parliamentarians included my organization in a recent meeting with the committee. New leadership of the Equal Opportunity Commission has more fully engaged with its statutory authority to conduct human rights promotion, public education, and keep laws under review. We make six simple and feasible recommendations regarding the EOC today and three regarding the EOA. Despite Trinidad and Tobago's significant wealth and our proven ability to quickly bring legislation into force, such as the abolition of judicial preliminary inquiries that included an infamous Section 34, which was even more expeditiously repealed, in Tomlinson v. Trinidad and Tobago this past week, the state argued before the Caribbean Court of Justice that it lacks human rights infrastructure and thereby the, quote, alacrity to amend laws to conform with its human rights obligations, and it therefore must rely heavily on administrative measures to do so. What is certain and was a focus of discussion at the IACHR's Caribbean Strengthening Seminar in which I participated is that in small, young island states with underdeveloped human rights institutions, rights bearers face particular vulnerabilities. The 27th December 2013 report from government's National Consultation for Constitutional Reform opens with similar observations about major majority and democracy in small states, and that in Trinidad and Tobago, quote, an image of the state has emerged as an agent of victimization, unquote. The report, offer, the report refers to the Office of the Ombudsman, a constitutional mechanism responsible for investigating injustice as a result of a fault in government administration as, quote, viewed as an ineffective institution, and Parliament does not take it seriously. Yet the report makes no recommendations for a constitutional reform to strengthen human rights. We've worked productively with an international law and human rights unit in the office of the Attorney General. Its small staff have made laudable efforts to bring the state further up to date with its responsibility for periodic reporting on compliance with international human rights obligations. But it lacks the authority of a national human rights institution, NHRI, as established under the Paris Principles, to counsel government and institutions on human rights best practices and compliance with human rights obligations and to ensure coherence and coordination with regional and international mechanisms. My colleague David will illustrate how this disconnect between documented human rights violations and redress and policy is a deep concern for people with HIV. In 2011, Trinidad and Tobago hosted a Caribbean workshop on NHRIs indicating state interest in establishing such an organ. Recommendation one, we urge the state to take immediate steps to bring the Equal Opportunity Commission in compliance with the Paris Principles and to initiate steps to have it accredited as a national human rights institution. We urge the ISCHR to partner and provide technical support to the state in attaining that achievement, which will be a model for other Commonwealth Caribbean states. Functions like this, recommended are where the ISCHR can have greatest relevance for states that are not parties to the American Convention. Paris Principles compliance would entail greater representativeness of skill and diversity on the EOC and stronger standards regarding conflict of interest and participation in political affairs. IACHR facilitated establishment of an NHRI can also play a role in invigorating public education about the IACHR itself and strengthening its use by citizens of Caribbean states. Our review of the IACHR website suggests that ours is the first use of the thematic hearing opportunity by human rights defenders in our state in 15 years. On that note, in November 2011, at the Universal Periodic Review, 
Trinidad and Tobago made a voluntary undertaking, the quote, the Ministry of the Attorney General, in conjunction with the Equal Opportunity Commission, is in the process of developing a nationwide human rights awareness campaign. In this regard, the International Law and Human Rights Unit in the Ministry of the Attorney General conducted a feasibility study to determine the most effective mechanism to reach the widest demographic. It is anticipated that the campaign, which is intended to sensitize target groups such as women, children, and vulnerable minority groups such as the differently abled, will be implemented in 2012. Such a campaign has not yet materialized. Recommendation two, we urge its implementation forthwith and are eager to assist the state in ensuring its reach, relevance, and effectiveness. Recommendation three, we urge the re-establishment of a Port of Spain office for the EOC. The EOC's regular office hours have admirably expanded to four new population centers, most recently with the relocation of its head office to the municipality with the largest population. However, the rationale for not maintaining a service site in the capital, where there is a concentration of employers, schools, and service provision, baffles us. The Equal Opportunity Drafters adopted a deliberately incremental approach to statuses covered by the law, though they commendably included disability in the law at first instance. The omission of three statuses has repeatedly troubled human rights bodies from the outset, who have echoed the same concerns over sexual orientation, HIV status, and age. From the UN Human Rights Committee in 2000, less than a year after the law's passage, to expert members of the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women the following year, to concluding observations of the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights the next. Under its enabling statute, the EOC is charged to keep the EOA and any other law under review, and has made recommendations to government for legislative amendments to the EOA. In 2011, this included the addition of age and HIV status, and in 2014, sexual orientation. But Parliament has not made this a priority. Recommendation four, remove the explicit exclusion of sexual orientation from the EOA and include sexual orientation in the statuses protected from discrimination in the EOA, but not in its offensive behavior provisions, which are in section seven B and C. The EOA not only omits sexual orientation from its scope, but explicitly declares that its protection from discrimination on the ground of sex, quote, does not include sexual orientation or sexual preference. The former vice chair of the EOC debating the bill as a senator said of the provision, here's where I think we are now building in a discrimination. For years, the EOC responded to appeals to recommend addition of sexual orientation to the Act's protection and offers a funding to study and document sexual orientation discrimination consistent with its mandate by urging LGBTI persons claiming discrimination to formally file complaints to enable the EOC to amass a body of data. They declined a proposal that they confidentially document some such cases outside of the formal complaint system. Some LGBTI persons did file cases without any protection of privacy. Their written complaints reviewed by a security guard for completeness and the substance of their complaints subject to a newspaper ad as a standard protocol. In two cases, DG, a transgender woman, and DD, a gay man with HIV, both mercilessly harassed at work. The matters were ruled to be out of jurisdiction. Having had their stories outed and been offered no protection, both citizens promptly sought asylum abroad successfully. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to present on behalf of an estimated 22,000 persons living with HIV in Trinidad and Tobago. For many of us, access to health care is an unnecessary, long, and painful process where one has to wait for hours to get blood work or to get just get the medication. Others are concerned with negotiating healthy relationships and the fear of rejection. Parents are worried about the impact of their status on their children who may be robbed of healthy social relationships and educational opportunities because of their parents' HIV status. I currently lead one of Trinidad's oldest and non-governmental organizations, Community Action Resource, in the National HIV Response. At our weekly psychosocial support groups, we discuss how stigma and discrimination impacts upon our lives as persons living with HIV. Many of us are on the road to self-acceptance, but we live in fear of our families and our communities finding out about our HIV status. We also discuss the challenge of entering into intimate partner relationships. Gay men in particular talk about how discriminating it can be 
to be both gay and positive. As one person said, and I quote, I fought so hard to be accepted as a gay person in a homophobic society. Now I have another battle. Does it ever end? Some of these concerns were reflected in a human rights initiative in 2012. This short-term project reports a total number of 91 complaints. While the details of the individual cases are not available, the common themes and grounds of discrimination were related to health care, housing, and work. However, we received a recent report of a woman who is being subject to psychological abuse because of her HIV status. Interestingly, she works in a public health care facility and her co-workers are the ones who are doing the naming and shaming. With respect to the workplace, the Ministry of Labor, Labor sorry, through its HIV AIDS Sustainability Center, has made significant strides on influencing workplace attitudes towards persons living with and affected by HIV. Since its establishment in 2011, it has reached a total of 109 organizations, uh, counting for 609 persons. These organizations, ranging from large-scale companies to small businesses, have not only provided education on HIV prevention, but, but through the creation of workplace policies, facilitate an enabling and supportive environment for persons living with HIV. Additionally, the Country Coordinating Mechanism for the National AIDS Response established a subcommittee titled Advocacy and Human Rights, whose goal was to heighten the national interest regarding HIV issues and to ensure the recognition of and respect for human rights of persons living with HIV, their families, targeted populations most at risk, such as men who have sex with men, sex workers, and other vulnerable groups. Unfortunately, the status of the CCM is uncertain and the subcommittee's work has been halted. In this context, the real challenge lies in not being able to ident officially identify, record, and document human rights infringements against persons living with HIV. Their concerns and complaints are usually received by non-governmental organizations who are often ill-equipped to, to, to handle such complaints, but try their best to reduce the level of stress and trauma experienced. The Equal Opportunities Commission is the ideal option for redress. However, there is a need to strengthen its capacity to build relationships with this community. The community remains largely unaware of its operations and its value. Additionally, there is need for a legal framework that acknowledges the rights of persons living with HIV to engage their lives free of discrimination. In 2011, a bill that would have added e HIV to the Equal Opportunities Act was presented in Parliament but never debated. There is currently a new proposal to include HIV as a disability within the Act. The, PA, the community itself has not been consulted on this proposal. For those who know, feel that this is a retrograde step. Stigma and discrimination continues to be a challenge in the HIV response. It is not only driving the epidemic, but serves as a key barrier in accessing prevention, treatment, care, and support services. It is also a cross-cutting issue as it relates to young people and sexual orientation. Sexual activity among young people is largely frowned upon, particularly if you're a girl. Healthcare providers are not always youth-friendly. Additionally, gay men are often fearful of getting tested in a public healthcare facility because of real or perceived discrimination by healthcare providers. In closing, we all want the same thing, fair and non-discriminatory access to health and social services. We need a legal framework to address these issues and the social mechanisms that allow us to report and hold our duty bearers accountable. Our fifth recommendation will be is that each of be included as a separate status within the Act. Thank you. Age. The time of life when a person does something or becomes legally able to do something. We spend most of our lives already wanting to do one thing when you're young, and so we wait. Wait for the right age when we can make decisions about ourselves for ourselves on our own. Wait to be told when we're old enough. Old enough to choose our own friends, to decide how our money should be spent, to get from point A to point B alone. But we never seem old enough, really. He says, nothing's wrong with this. And she, she believed him. She doesn't know the, the risks of unprotected sex. She believed that saying yes was her only choice because she didn't really have a choice. She's just 15 and he, he's a big man. She doesn't know she has the right to say no because all she can remember are times before 
when her age determined the range of authority she had. So authority was given to anyone with superiority in age. We spend most of our young lives being told what to do, and it's never really explained why. So when the time comes and it's our turn to decide, we're none the wiser. She's a teenager now. How can the same rules still apply? So she's trusting his guide. Even a Nancy's tricks were better disguised, but in her growing up, that's what she's taught. That adults make the decisions, that they look out for our interests. How will she know that if her instincts say no, she has the right to say no? She asks her best friends, but none of them knows any better. I mean, who really knows about their rights at 15? This should never be. We should be aware of the standards we can set, what we should accept and how to say no and what we can do if that's met with disrespect in any and all cases, not just when it comes to sex. What are her rights? Age. The length of time a person has lived or a thing has existed. And she waits. She waits on help that will never come and she struggles to stand up. She's fallen and she can't get up. But no one's there to help. So she lies there, helpless, waiting for the ones who love her to love her. She was a mother and a father. A grandmother. She was super. She was the lighthouse on the shores of the sea of her existence. But the lighthouse lights going out. And with memory fading and health shaking, she's abandoned, not in a home, but in her home. Her place of rest and recuperation has become a dome of isolation. The pitter patter of feet on the floor that blend melodiously with the shrieks of laughter of youth no longer fill these halls. Instead, they're replaced by her wails and groans for assistance. She's been left alone. She's going to die soon, so why are I going there? For the second time, she's a child. No mother or father to care for her. No son or daughter cares for her. And this is normal, being left in a corner out of sight. But it isn't right. What are her rights? Age. An individual's development measured in terms of the years requisite for light development of the average individual. And he? He wants to swim. He wants to wet his feet, feel the moist sand squish between his toes, hear the wind blow through the trees, feel the cool breeze across his face. He wants the sun beating on his skin. He wants the bittersweet taste on his tongue. He wants saline filled eyes, but no one's been crying here. He wants bruised knees on sandy shores cause that first wave caught him off guard. Hit him to the floor, but he'll be ready for the next one. He's trained. 15 years of preparation, he trained. Learned freestyle and breaststroke, how the knight's eye controls the tide. He studied backstroke and deep dive, but he's still never actually gone diving because he keeps hitting the same wall. The blue-green waves keep him at shore. There are other swimmers here trying to dive in too. You're not what we want to represent the company because the lines on his face aren't equivalent to the lines on theirs, but the lines of his credentials surpass theirs. He says, I need this job to survive but he never gets to jump into nature's swimming pool, even though when he checks the rules, he has what it takes to swim with the big kids. They equate his youth with stupidity or dishonesty or whatever stereotype they can perpetuate to meet their agenda because these are young traits. Of course, there are things he doesn't know and he doesn't think like you, but you didn't always think the way you do. You forget you were once young too and he wonders if this is really why he spent 15 years in school. What are his rights? Age discrimination, placing value on a number to take it away from a person. When we're too busy buying into definitions to stop denying folks' positions, we create the same conflictions of the words we all just listened to. Knowledge is power. And in this new age fight, the EOA could provide the power, help clear your sight, arm yourselves with knowledge, your strongest weapon. But be careful with your words. Great responsibility comes with this power. Never be greedy. Share this power. Let young people know we've not yet been stripped of the ability to act responsibly. Know your rights. We deserve a chance too, to learn about what we should and shouldn't do to be treated with love and respect, not just left on our bed for dead, to be judged based on qualification first, to access information and get an education about our rights. Young people, know your rights. It's our right. It's our right. The Sixth Amendment. Add age to the EOA. It's only right. Thank you. Thank you so much <clears throat> for, the, uh, for the presentations, the information, uh, and the, the final thoughts. 
before we begin, I should uh, mention that I'm joined uh, on the panel today by my fellow commissioners, uh, Madam Tracy Robinson, former president of the commission, and also the rapporteur for the rights of women and uh, the rights of LGBTI persons. Uh, and to my left is uh, Commissioner Paolo Vanucchi, uh, who is the commissioner responsible for our unit on economic, social, and cultural rights. And my name is uh, Jim Cavallaro. Uh, let me start, if I, if I would, with uh, Commissioner uh, Robinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I can begin by saying how much I welcome this hearing, um, to thank the petitioning organizations. Um, I deeply regret the absence of the state, um, particularly in light of what you described as a moment of promise, um, but a promise which uh, cannot be meaningfully engaged um, without the full participation of the state. Um, of course, the Commission welcomes the response of the state in writing or engagement with us otherwise to follow up on the important themes which you've raised. You mentioned that the last time we had a similar such hearing would have been 15 years ago, and we actually have few such hearings in relation to the English-speaking Caribbean. Of course, I particularly welcome the different presentations, particularly the last piece of poetry shared with us. I worried for my colleagues as I heard the nation language um, and whether everyone could follow. Um, but of course, for me, it was a pleasure to hear the issues relating to human rights articulated um, through this story about pro possibility and promise unrealized because of age discrimination. Um, many of us are familiar with the challenges with the Equal Opportunities Act um, and the limited um, definition of discrimination in it. I take note of the Court of Appeals decision um, uh, many years ago that that limitation, particularly in relation to sexual orientation, in their view violated the principles of the Constitution and its commitment to equality. I also want to take note of the many other international human rights bodies that have called attention to the limited categories and the need, and I think um, eloquently expressed, um, for sexual orientation, issues relating to HIV um, and H to also be included. And I would join um, that call uh, to the government. And I hope that the current discussions materialize in the reforms which are being discussed. Um, I um, also welcome the discussion around national human rights institutions um, and would particularly wish to hear from the state about um, the possibility of strengthening the Equal Opportunities Commission um, as a national human rights institution. But I wanted to hear your thoughts on the Office of the Ombuds, um, Ombudsman and whether you think there are ways in which it can become an even more useful um, institution in protecting the human rights uh, of persons living with HIV, um, LGBTI persons, and persons who suffer from age discrimination. Um, as interested in relation to HIV, um, having heard the very, very clear call for it to be included um, as a uh, a category of discrimination, to hear more about your strong objections to incorporating HIV as a form of disability, and to hear precisely um, the concerns of um, the community about why that is a regressive step for you. Um, I, um, I also took note, um, and hope others do, of the very specific ways in which you have described um, discrimination in the health sector, um, including for employees in the health sector, um, not just persons who are seeking services, but you mentioned someone who was HIV positive and an employee of a public health institution who also suffers discrimination um, at work and your call for fair and non-discriminatory practices um, and services, and I wish to, to join in that. Um, I'm going to stop here, you know, depending on the time, I might have another opportunity, um, but to just see how pleased I am that you're here. And I hope there's an opportunity for many others to participate in the discussion after. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Robinson. Let me uh, pass the floor, if I may, to uh, Commissioner Vanuki. <clears throat> 
Gracias, presidente. Eh, comienzo por agradecer. I'll be waiting. <laughs> Are you ready for the fight? Thank you. Uh, agradecer su presencia, la iniciativa de la audiencia, lamentar la ausencia de representación estatal. Have you found the channel? No. Okay. No. Gracias. Uh, por la iniciativa de la audiencia, por su presencia, por las informaciones, lamento la ausencia de la representación estatal. Y mi primera pregunta, ese, ese es un padrón. Si el Estado, eh, su costumbre es de no presentarse para un diálogo abierto o si hubo algún problema eh, extraordinario. Y como responsable por la unidad temática, derechos económicos, sociales y culturales. Y pienso que siendo esta quizá la única audiencia de Trinidad y Tobago, no puedo perder la oportunidad de hacer algunas preguntas sobre, preguntas sobre uh, la situación más general de los derechos económicos, porque uh, el objetivo de esta audiencia es eh, concentrado en uh, equal opportunity, en uh, non-discrimination. Pero es lo, la oportunidad de saber un poco más cómo son las condiciones generales de trabajo, de salario, de acción de los sindicatos de trabajadores, cuestión de la pobreza en especial, cómo es. Porque cuando se estudian los indicadores generales de, de Trinidad y Tobago, siempre eh, el propio informe unilateral y algunos eh, de Estados Unidos, algunos de las Naciones Unidas, también... Eh, muchas veces se centran en las cuestiones de violencia policial, de personas privadas de libertad, debido al proceso, pero a mí me interesa como relator conocer más sobre las cuestiones generales, eh, niveles de pobreza en el país, si hay programas de distribución de renta y de enfrentamiento de pobreza, si hay situaciones de hambre, eh, desempleo y todas las condiciones sobre tierra, tierra, trabajo, eh, salarios, lo que sea. Gracias. Thank you, Commissioner Venuki and Commissioner Robinson. Uh, uh, let me underscore as well my disappointment as rapporteur, country rapporteur for Trinidad and Tobago, that the state is not present. Uh, I also uh, welcome. Uh, as my colleagues have uh, your presence this hearing. I hope that it is uh, the first of uh, many hearings and opportunities for engagement by the Commission uh, with uh, civil society and with the state, we hope, in Trinidad and, and, and Tobago. Uh, let me do this. Uh, let me give you, if I could, uh, six minutes to respond, and then we can have a few more questions as the president, uh, as, I'm sorry, as a former president, <laughs> I'm so used to Tracy as president, excuse me, as former President Robinson uh, uh, suggested to have more of a dialogue. So let me, if I can, offer the floor for seven minutes to respond to these questions and then, and then have another set of, of short questions. You won't waste the time arguing. Um, they will respond on the HIV disability issues. I'm not terribly well prepared to talk about um, economic conditions. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago is widely perceived, and in fact, um, income levels are comparatively high. One of the things that actually drives violence in Trinidad and Tobago is income inequality and inequality of opportunity. Those are, in many instances, the social roots um, 
of a particular kind of citizen insecurity that is pervasive, a, polit a polit political frameworks that increasingly promote uh, political tribalism are also to account for relatively weak um, experiences of inclusion and democracy, and I think underlie the government's own report about the state being seen as an agent of victimization, um, often as a political agent of victimization. Um, the sexual orientation is certainly, as, along with HIV and other statuses, one of the compounding factors that drive inequality of opportunity. And increasingly, I think the openings to, to, to change in that area will be that recognition more so than the historic concerns around, morality concerns around sexuality. Um, to answer uh, uh, Commissioner Robinson's questions about the Office of the Ombudsman, it's not an office that we have targeted particularly, um, uh, in part because we too have shared the perception documented by the Constitutional Reform Commission about the, the office's ineffectiveness and lack of funding, um, and have seen the Equal Opportunity Commission, even though it's not a constitutional mechanism, um, as something that has shown more promise, more visible leadership, more engagement with communities, um, the mere fact that it, it has offices in multiple places um, and that it has a communications infrastructure have placed it in a more favorable position in many ways um, than the Office of the Ombudsman. The enabling constitutional language of the office also um, have, has not made it clear. Um, has, its mission is not necessarily a living one in people's um, lives. And I'm not able to say much more than that. David? Okay, thanks. Um, I just need to, I was just trying to frame my thoughts on HIV and the disability issue. Uh, one of the major concerns is that, they, that if the committee feels that it's, it's almost like telling us that we are disabled when we're not disabled. And that becomes, that becomes a very contentious issue because we've fought hard to be, make ourselves be healthy, be productive, working individuals. Um, additionally, what it does, it, it will also place limitations on what we can and cannot report on. So for instance, how do I report uh, harassment in the workplace based on my um, HIV status? Or I'm denied um, a, a, a position, or I'm denied a promotion? How does that fit under disability? So those are some of the questions and concerns that the community has about placing it under this very narrow confines of disability. Now there, are, there, there is legislation uh, uh, as well that exists for in other countries that where, it's, where it's included separately and has worked well. If I might jump in as well, I've not had an opportunity to talk as richly as I had hoped with people in the disability community before this hearing, but I know that the uh, provisions of the Act have not been taken advantage of even by people with other disabilities. Um, and there's a widespread perception that's being promoted that the hardship exceptions vitiate the protections of the Act. I personally don't think that's a fact and that we need to develop the case law to, to undermine that perception. But I think there's a lot of fear in using the Equal Opportunity Act's disability protections because of the perception that um, hardship will trump any right. Employer hardship. Okay, we have <clears throat> a few more minutes. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, my colleagues, uh, beginning with uh, Commissioner Robinson, uh, if, if you have follow-up questions. Uh, maybe observations more so than questions. Um, to indicate that the Commission hopes to hold a uh, uh, workshop with Ombudsman throughout the English-speaking Caribbean um, to present an opportunity for dialogue with ombudsmen in Latin America as well, and to, to also point out the possibilities of ombudsmen using the commission as well. Um, we re receive and um, have requests for hearings from ombuds um, to bring attention to specific issues in the countries of Latin America in particular. 
And I think there are also opportunities as we begin to share with each other um, to ensure that the human rights of all are protected. And so I think we need a strong commission, um, Equal Opportunities Commission, but I would be very interested in seeing how the Office of the Ombudsman, not just in Trinidad and Tobago, but elsewhere, um, can begin to serve some of the rules which um, we're all invested in. Um, and um, I'll, I'll stop there for now. So I think I think there, there are opportunities for us. And I'm, I see an opportunity for Trinidad uh, to be a leader um, region-wide on some of these questions. I noted that we received a message to the Commission from the Equal Opportunities Commission in relation to this hearing and to indicate to the state um, that they are perfectly entitled to invite the Commission to be a part of their delegation in a hearing like this so that the Commission hears the position of the state but also has an opportunity to dialogue with the Commission and to invite them to do so the next time an opportunity like this presents itself. And I welcome the initiatives which the Commission has described to the Inter-American Commission that it has been engaged in um, to invite it to continue to do the good work which it is undertaking, but to ask for the support in relation to the strengthening of the Commission as a national human rights institution and the broadening of its mandate to more additional areas. Uh, thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> Commissioner Vanuki has indicated that he has no further questions. I, as uh, country rapporteur for Trinidad and Tobago, uh, would like to ask uh, if you uh, would indulge me by reflecting on uh, the following question. What do you think that this commission, the Inter-American Commission, uh, can do jointly with civil society and with the state uh, to, to help the promise of the uh, EOA be realized, to help that be expanded to groups that are not included, uh, to enhance the uh, effectiveness of the EOC in practice, uh, and more generally to respond uh, to discrimination uh, in, in, in Trinidad and, and, and Tobago. So uh, again, uh, whether that be right now, uh, in a later meeting today, uh, in subsequent uh, written submissions, uh, we're eager to, to, to play a role that's collaborative, uh, that works with civil society and with the state, uh, as Commissioner Robinson said, uh, uh, to, to help m move Trinidad to be a, a regional reference in, in this area uh, rather than a, a site in which uh, the promise is, is not fulfilled. So I'll leave you with that final comment and uh, you, you have five minutes for any uh, comments or responses that you, you care to make at this time. We certainly will take advantage of the opportunity to follow up with more specific and targeted recommendations. One that is, um, I think, really fe relatively evident to us is that a country visit um, can create a vast opportunity for engagement and for engagement across a number of arms of the state um, and can create visibility for both the domestic Equal Opportunity Commission but also the Inter-American Commission's work. Um, and uh, that a visit can be accompanied by, can be, could be the occasion for the launch of national training and awareness activities as we've um, requested. But whatever the Inter-American Commission can do to uh, strengthen the efforts of all state institutions, not just government ones, um, in fulfilling their human rights obligations is, is certainly welcomed by all of us. Again, thank you so much uh, for bringing this matter to our attention. Uh, it's one of concern for the Commission. Uh, we regret the, the absence of the state. Uh, nonetheless, we, we do hope that we can continue to promote dialogue and advance in this area. And again, our thanks. Uh, with that, the session is adjourned.